more. Oh, interesting, our, uh, interesting. And, um, Did you guys do all the pre-reading I gave you, like a hundred books, well, right? <laughs> it, it, I said to, to Kevin, let's compile it as sort of a po like a, an optional but more post-reading journey. Yes, okay? I agree with that. I'll just so drape this over here, here for you not guys. Not only about nonprofit purpose, but thinking about um, creative execution and social movements. So Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much and for having me. Here as well, so yeah. From Canada, from New York. Thank well, you. it's it's a it's been a bit of a travel, but uh, I actually uh, was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's a short <laughs> ride down the Mass Turnpike. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, but I've been living in New York City for 13 years, so if I start speaking really fast and dropping all my R's, someone just raise a hand and let me know to slow down, okay? Um, one of the pre-readings that I didn't give you guys, but something you should check out, is this book by uh, James Webb Young here. It's a, a technique for producing ideas, okay? So it's a quick read, pretty fun. Uh, this, uh, this talk will be fun. It will be creative, and uh, hopefully it will be inspiring. Uh, at the end, we'll do a little q and I'll be hanging out with you guys for lunch, so happy to chat with you more about that later. Um, let's see, let's get started here. So just some technical things about uh, the fact I'm an MBA student, so the ideas that are in here, some of them are mine, some of them are borrowed. Everyone owns the rights to them already. Um, you might be familiar with this gentleman, Richard Edelman. Uh, that's how Christiane and I know each other. He's famous for saying, Brands are the new democracy, and that really ties into the social purpose story that we're going to talk about today. A bit of free advice I'd like to give you all. Creativity is not everyone's job, but it is everyone's responsibility, okay? And we're going to talk a lot about that as we go through this talk today. Uh, as previously stated, I'm Gil. I'm a copywriter. I'm a creative director, an MBA student, a professor, and a DJ who lives in New York City. <laughs> I'm also a pirate. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, some of the logos that you see up there are just to represent some of the things that I've done. As I mentioned, I'm an st MBA student at the Berlin School of Creative Leadership. It's a global uh, executive MBA program, a partnership with uh, Harvard Business School, um, ICS in Japan, uh, and several other universities around the world. Uh, I go to study in Berlin, study at UC Berkeley, uh, studied in Japan, Shanghai most recently. So great program. If you're all interested, check it out. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Connecticut. I did clinical research at Brown University, and currently I teach copywriting to design students at Kane University in Union, New Jersey, which, as you can imagine, is like pushing a rock up a hill backwards. <laughs> I've given this talk at a few interesting places, uh, most recently Indiana University, Kelly School of Business, um, also Wenzhou Keen University in China, uh, UC Berkeley, and a couple of other places. Looking at my past, uh, you probably read in my bio that I've uh, been uh, lucky enough to win some really amazing uh, industry awards, partly because of that flag that you see in front of you. I'm currently consulting for a, a luxury furniture company in Denmark, helping them develop their social purpose marketing campaign. Uh, we're de developing a uh, workstation for kids that we're going to do a buy one, give one model to, uh, to help kids in conflict zones learn uh, good study habits. And if you think about it, uh, for a 10-year-old kid growing up in some of these areas, they may never have seen a desk before or even been into a school. So that, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, Edelman, Ogilvy, some of the agencies I worked at. Um, most interestingly, I guess people always are surprised. I was uh, military police in the United States Army for six years, uh, where I developed some pretty interesting leadership skills and uh, some habits. If you ever see my closet, you will not be surprised. Um, I mentioned I'm a DJ. I've been uh, you know, in the music arts for a long time. I have my own record label that I've had about 15, 16 years now. It's very interesting. If you guys like underground dance music, check it out. Um, and uh, this is where I live in New York City, in Hell's Kitchen. Any of, any of you guys been there? All right, stop by, say hi next time. <laughs> so what is social purpose? We talk a lot about it. What does it mean? Purpose marketing taps into social movements that represent progressive social norms. It's a way to connect with an audience by appealing to their values. And it's how we tap into the social zeitgeist to show that we get it. But not all of us do, right? As storytellers, we have to ask ourselves, what counts as social purpose? Why does it matter? Who cares? And who can do this work responsibly? Because, as you'll see in a minute, this can be a very slippery slope. What do you guys think about this? It's cool? Social purpose? hits all the right buttons, makes you feel good. What about this? <laughs> yeah. What about this? I heard you guys were talking about this a moment ago. Yeah, you guys cried for this one? I cried for a different reason. <laughs> what about this one? My nemesis, fearless girl. Um, OK, interesting. What do you guys think about the feedback? 
Did you know all of this? Yeah. Anything surprising to anyone up here? No. no. no? So you guys all like Fearless Girl, even though it got the company that did it sued? <laughs> they get sued on purpose? They didn't think through. They didn't, think through. They didn't realize the blowback that was potential for what you're doing. I think I heard the last speaker say that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just something that you guys should keep in mind going forward. With Gillette, yeah, it's a great ad, but was it really authentic? That's debatable, right? Looking at the Colin Kaepernick ad, it obviously was authentic. I mean, you can't argue with a bump in your stock price, eh? So social movements are really ideas unto themselves, right? And brands and organizations rarely, if ever, start these movements, although they try and try and try again. Um, however, they can connect with movements through storytelling and shared values. And that's where people like myself come in, and hopefully some of you too. But these organizations should only do this when they truly live these values, and you guys have seen some examples of what that looks like when they don't. Uh, you guys are welcome to take pictures and record, but I did give you guys a leave-behind version of this with like another 50 slides in the appendix for you to go through, so um, you know, feel you, you'll have a lot to play with. So let's get back to the basics, okay? Social purpose has many definitions and, frankly, purposes. And it's often similar to, but not always the same as a motto, a vision statement, or a tagline, right? And some companies are doing a better job at this than others. There's a few companies up here I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, right? Uh, Google, one of the companies near and dear to my heart, uh, their motto is do no evil, right? But their mission statement is to organize the world's information in a way to make it universally accessible and useful, okay? So those are two different sort of, you know, places that they're coming from. And a great example, um, something Google's done recently near and dear to my heart, is Grow with Google. Uh, do you guys know what that is? What they do they, um, for veterans? Anyone here, former military? No? There you go. Oh, what was your MOS? There you go. If you put an 88H or 88 hotel into the Google search browser, it'll match jobs for you that meet your military occupational specialty. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I like that as well. She's a fashion designer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I was a military policeman. Now I'm a professor. So, I mean, how do we all get here, you know? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thanks for your service. <laughs> no kidding, huh? So, Dove, their motto, you are more beautiful than you think. Pretty cool, right? Their mission, though, is beauty should be a source of confidence and not anxiety. I think we can all get behind that. And then when you look at the work that they do, you have the campaign for real beauty, which is really great work, right? Tom's, one for one. I like that. But their mission is actually takes, it takes that a step further, right? By giving one shoe for every shoe that you buy. And then an example of that is we stand together. You guys familiar with this, right? So this is sort of like their purpose and action sort of platform, which is really cool. So uh, real big fan of, uh, of these brands up here today. Social purpose marketing helps organizations establish deep and meaningful connections with their audience. This connection gives them credibility and authenticity to the messaging platforms that are unique and ownable. Nonprofit organizations and NGOs are by their nature purpose-driven organizations, which makes them really fun to work with. But recently, um, you guys had that market cornered, but that's changing pretty fast because you're sharing the space with mission-driven organizations from the profit and for the not-for-profit world, some of those you just saw from the last speaker. Now you have the rise of the B Corp. You guys familiar with the B Corp? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so you're going to be faced, for those of you in the nonprofit sector, are going to be faced with more and more competition and more and more battle for resources. So here's marketing in a nutshell, right? So the best way to beat meet competition is with creativity. Uh, the intermediate step for that I want you guys to think of is you don't need a million dollars to do this, or even a hundred. But what you do need is an idea. This flag is an idea. It's an icon, it's an archetype, it's an artifact in the world that people can relate to because it tells a story. And that story is how we connect with people and how we get our brand message across. So, spoiler alert, ideas don't cost money. I'm part of a team called Pirates for Positive Change. And Pirates for Positive Change is a global network of activist creatives and entrepreneurs who care about social injustice. We're self-organizing teams of collaborative problem solvers committed to using our creative power to help others. And we do this by fundamentally changing the way that teams approach creativity by applying agile methodology. Are you guys familiar with agile methodology? 
who is not familiar with Agile methodology. Okay, great. So basically that borrows from a way of uh, software development work in uh, Silicon Valley where they create teams and prod pods around a particular challenge or problem, but they're self-sustaining teams. So the way that we approach it as creatives is we all take multiple roles, right? I'm a, I'm a copywriter by trade and a creative leader, but I also now work as a strategist, as a brand partner, as an account person. So we all have multiple roles. So when you work in an agile team, you usually have multiple responsibilities. More or less make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. So once we do that, we partner with governments, businesses, and vendors to deliver the innovative and impactful executions on a global scale that I'm going to show you. Creative pirates follow a very strict code. It's not as, all as easy and as fun as it sounds. You have to be willing to kill your darlings. Do you know what that means? So to kill your darlings means to be willing to uh, sacrifice your idea for the greater good of the, of the team. And all, everyone has to work for the idea. Anyone in here creative? Yeah, okay, so you all know about competition and the ego and just all the nonsense that goes on inside of a creative team, okay? So that was probably what uh, myself and my teammates found was the biggest problem that was actually killing creativity, right? We were really just cannibalizing each other because we all want to beat the next guy and girl. We're all a team of problem solvers and decision makers, okay? The decision maker is actually the really important part here. For those of us who've worked in creative environments, you oftentimes are, hey, look at this idea, and you want someone else to tell you it's the, the right idea and the right direction to go. No, you need to take that on to yourself, okay? There are no quitters allowed. You know who's a pirate and who's not a pirate when something goes wrong, because they'll start to, they'll start to complain, and then they won't want to participate anymore. You always have to reflect on what you're doing. Uh, you know, being in, in, insightful is a very important part of creativity and part of leadership as well. Be open to giving and receiving feedback. This is something that maybe is natural to a lot of you, but is not really natural to some. Maybe the receiving, but not the giving. Embrace agile working, as I mentioned, in the group dynamic. Uh, be willing to do more than your job. This is really important about going above and beyond. Um, and this is something that I learned you know, at, at Ogilvy, is something that they kind of train us all in, is to ask and think, what is the problem and how can I help? So when you see someone struggling with something, or you see someone trying to figure it out, ask them, what's the problem? What can I do to help, okay? So now I'm gonna go and show you a few of the projects that we've done um, as Pirates. The first project that we launched was called Freedom Voices, and it was a way to hack international censorship laws. I think you might be familiar with the people that are up there, Malala, Ai Weiwei, uh, Edward Snowden. Can I, yeah, go. Sorry, I just have to ask a question. So you're an organization, so like other organizations would hire? We're actually not an organization. We're a shadow network of creative activists. Okay, so is that not We don't exist. We're like the A-team. So then how do you get hired for a project? We don't get hired. Oh, okay. We don't get hired. We don't get paid. I see, I see. Okay. We do this. We use our creativity for good and we use it generously and selflessly because we believe in the issues in which we are working for. We all have jobs doing other things, okay? <laughs> this is not how we get paid, um, which makes it sort of interesting and very altruistic and I think really adds to the work, right? Um, something that I'm learning and reading the book Drive. If, are you guys familiar with Drive by Dan Pink? Uh, check it out, there's a really cool video. Um, be really inspired. So Freedom Voices, uh, so I'm going to show you the case study video. But one thing I want you guys to take a look at here is zero dollars spent, okay? This didn't cost any money. Let's see if this will work. There are those in the world a little bit loud. who have lost the right to speak out for what they believe or for who they believe in. But there are some who make themselves heard but they are being silenced. We need the world to speak up and join the fight against censorship. Amnesty partnered with Backslash to lift sync impact and created Freedom Voices. Amnesty uploaded famous quotes to Backslash from activists like Ai Weiwei and Malala. The only solution is education, education, education users to lend their voices. The only solution is education, education, education. Let no one be forgotten. Words have the power to change the world. Violence is a choice, and it's a choice that a man makes. We can choose to stop it. Recognize that guy? <laughs> So far, one million deaths have 
have been shared on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter in 180 countries, making a total of 34 days of non-stop talking. So again, just to show you guys that it's the idea that matters, right? I think a lot of people, they say, oh, I have an idea. We're going to take this app and we're going to make it do this. I was just judging awards for the New York Festival, right? And I was just trashing people left and right that are trying to use the iWatch to like alert people they're having heart attacks. And I'm like, are you crazy? Like, it's not going to work. So, <laughs> you know, not to mention going to get sued, like, to high hell. So are you familiar with the app Dub Smash? It's a lip syncing app. It was really popular in Brazil, of all places, right? Uh, where, where kids are, would basically videotape themselves singing a Madonna song or whatever, right? So we just saw the app and saw a new use for the app, right? To, to bring this social purpose message. Those speeches already existed. We just worked with Amnesty International to get the rights for it. It was simple, but powerful at the same time, right? So I talked to you guys a little bit about the refugee nation. You might have seen a little bit of the ref refugee nation on your own. Um, this number, 1.7 billion, is a little outdated. We currently now have over 5 billion media impressions with zero dollars spent on media, okay? So I'll let the uh, case study video play and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay, how do I know? For the first time ever, a refugee team was going to compete in the Olympics. Ten athletes with no national team, no flag, and no anthem to call their own. The whole world was looking at them. Could we turn a team of ten into a team of millions? The Olympic refugees have been making a name for themselves, and now they may have a flag. <coughs> We partnered with refugees across the globe to design a flag and compose an anthem to represent the athletes. Flag in Orange is a symbol of solidarity with all the brave souls that have to cross the sea to look for safety in a new country. Refugee athletes embraced the national symbol. The crowd got two new colors to cheer for. And in one of the most formal and organized events, a new nation broke in, raising a flag for those who were forced to leave their own country. From Lesbos to Kakuma, refugee camps now shared a symbol of hope. And for the first time ever, a symbolic nation was officially recognized at the One Young World Summit. Qatar, the refugee nation. The flag made it to the most political Oscars ever. With refugees everywhere, I'm actually wearing a pin for the refugee nation as well. And was exhibited at MoMA and the Victoria and Albert Museum. We live in such a visual world now that people will start to recognize the flag with the discussion. The flag is, is in the permanent collection of the PLA Museum now because it marks a um, crucial moment in the contemporary history. So obviously that was a really awesome project to be a part of. Uh, that's where the pirate team really sort of found its stride. And we were all fortunate enough to win uh, Titanium at Cannes um, Grand Prix, best of show, multiple places. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing uh, the, the impact that such a simple idea can have. Now, I will tell you, this thing almost failed a thousand times. It died 10,000 deaths, okay? And it wasn't until we actually stepped back and said, Nobody wants to hear from a group of creatives in New York. They want to hear from refugees. Who are we to decide a flag for these people? Let's get them on board and let's work with them collaboratively. And that's when everything took off, okay? So just again, to think about what I said a moment ago about living the values and being authentic and really speaking to things that you really can speak to, okay? This is just, there's another video I won't play for you, but uh, this is a pile of uh, discarded life jackets um, in Lesbos, Greece. And uh, this video goes on to talk about this organization that we partner with in Amsterdam called Makers Unite. 
And what they do is they give refugees, that newly, newly settled refugees in the Netherlands, their first jobs making um, accessories out of recycled life vests. So they're making little mini flags that hopefully soon will be at the MoMA Design Store and some other museums around the world. For those of you that visit New York City, you can find this flag hanging in the, um, the gallery of the, uh, of the Museum of Modern Art, which is pretty cool the first time I saw it there. This is a video there. Um, actually, it's just a, it's a tour guide talking to a bunch of schoolgirls about, uh, about this flag and talking about Yara Said's story, which is probably like, you know, like very goosebumpy, tear-jerking kind of stuff. Uh, but really is when it hit me, like the power of what we had done, right? It went way beyond winning awards and then getting attention for ourselves. It was actually really helping people and really helping educate another a new generation of people. Go ahead. How did the media bite start with all this? Like, mm -hmm. did you go to a network first? How did that? You know, this was not a briefed project, right? It was, again, it was very proactive. So we did it all on our own, through our own personal connections. For instance, through my music connections, I was able to reach the, the, um, the artist MIA. Is everyone familiar with MIA? Her album Borders was all orange and black, right? So, I mean, I was emailing like people furiously, right? Until I got in contact with her, and then she posted our flag on Instagram. So again, that goes back to the pirate agile mentality of like do everything ourselves, okay? It's not like, hey, can you go take care of that for me? And you're like, okay, fine. But if you are, there's some sort of reciprocity, right? Because there's no money being exchanged. And I think that also kind of helped, right? That we weren't coming from, you know, from any other place but, but our hearts, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Are these organizations coming to you? We are going to them most times. Okay. Now they come to us, right? Because of the, the popularity of the flag. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's a little bit of push and pull on, bo on both sides. So if you go to the refugeenation.com or .org, I forget now what the extension is. It's basically a, a hub for connecting people. You scroll all the way down to the bottom. You can hire a refugee. You can get connected to another refugee. So it's kind of a portal for, for connecting people. So that's a lot of a lot of folks find us. Uh, we're in a bunch of design museums right now, uh, and a lot of those folks came to us. You know, just basically through through word of mouth. So this picture here is from the main lobby of the Museum of Modern Art. And what you see here is the Refugee Nation flag next to another pretty interesting flag that I think you guys all might know, who was coincidentally designed by a guy named Gilbert. Uh, but it is a project that the pirate team uh, was able to put together and to launch recently called Type with Pride. In 1978, Gilbert Baker created the Rainbow Flag, one of the world's most powerful cultural symbols. In 2017, the artist and activist passed away. To honor Gilbert Baker, NYC Pride and Newfest wanted to give his iconic flag a voice. We created Gilbert a font inspired by the rainbow flag. We launched Gilbert during Pride Month in a place its colors could really shine. The whole world was invited to install it and use it for free. And what started as a tribute to Gilbert ended up becoming a powerful tool to support the cause he always fought for. The LGBTQ community made the font its own voice. Gilbert soon sparked conversations around the globe. Even the vice president joined in. Everyone. Everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity.
So for any art directors and the designers here, you can download that font from typewithpride.com. I believe it's even in uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, that font is showing up everywhere, like constantly on social media. People from the team are posting things from all over the world. We're even trying to launch a project right now in India, as you know, who just recently passed uh, a right to marry. Uh, this is something that we did at Edelman. Uh, so it was pir the pirate team was involved, but this was actually sort of a, uh, a, a project we did within an agency to give you an example of how this could work. Um, you all here are familiar with the WNBA? As a University of Connecticut alumni, I was first introduced to uh, copywriting when I read a bumper sticker that said, uh, University of Connecticut, where men are men and women are champions which I always got to chuckle out of. So when, uh, when the WNBA approached us and said, hey, you know, uh, our ticket sales are, are flagging here. You know, like the New York Liberty got kicked out of Madison Square Garden. It's like, what's going on? These, these women are like top of their game athletes and like all over the world they're celebrated and at the NCAA, I mean, they're, they're killing it. Then they get to the professional leagues and nobody cares. No one's even coming to the games. Yet you look at what's going on in, in uh, society right now with, with women's rights and women's issues are more prevalent than ever, more top of mind. Why is this such a disconnect? I don't think we solved the disconnect, but this was our attempt to do it. So it's kind of a quick video, so I'll try to explain it real quick while I make sure this other video doesn't start playing. I knew that was going to happen. So, yeah. Just play it again for fun, right? Uh, boy, I was afraid someone was going to ask me that question. No, I don't know off the top of my head. Anyone else know, maybe? Yes, you could Shazam it. <laughs> so, um, you know, what was really interesting, so take a seat to take a stand, right? Pretty straightforward concept. You can buy a ticket in a certain part of the stadium to support a particular NGO or nonprofit affiliated with the women's rights movement, right? Pretty cool. Um, the idea that we really had that we wanted to launch, and so you've heard it, you will hear it here first if it actually happens, which scared the bejesus out of the WNBA, was in order to achieve true equality, you need to lose the pronoun. So get rid of the W. The idea was called dunk the W. And just make it the NBA. You're, you're, it's already owned by the NBA. I mean, it's not that hard, right? Um, and the, some people really loved it. Some people were petrified by the idea. So ultimately, we didn't go forward with it. But if you see it happen, you heard it here first, folks. Um, I'm going to uh, run through quickly a couple projects that I didn't do that I just um, I saw recently as I was judging some stuff for the New York Festival. Uh, you can check these out on your own or click through them in the, the leave behind. This is a poster in Brazil done for, by, Habitat, by Huma, Habitat for Humanity. When it, um, so there's a big problem in tropical zones with mosquitoes, right? And Zika and all these other transmittable diseases. When, this, when it rains, this poster melts and turns into an insecticide. Sure. And it lasts for like, multi, like months like in a puddle of water, right? Like essentially just killing those larvae right there on the spot. Um, this one is called She Gives Birth, You Give Blood. Um, for the mothers in the room, I'm sure you can uh, identify with going into all these multiple doctor's appointments and having a supportive person with you, but at the same time, they are also didn't, you know, on their phones, don't know what to do, right? So the Red Cross in Australia put this campaign together that the partner would come in and give blood while the mother was in getting their checkups or, or whatever diagnostics that were going on, right? So there's a bit of shared, you know, shared thing happening, right? Really cool, but it's just an idea. It doesn't cost any money. <laughs> I'm sure there was lots of fainting. Lots of fainting, which, which must have made for very interesting conversations at home, right? <laughs> About like, who's really going through the trauma here, huh? Um, this one I found to be really powerful, uh, you know, and, and I wasn't aware of it at the time. 
Um, during the, uh, I guess, must have been World War II, Japan had occupied Korea for a particular, for several years, and the soldiers took some of the young single women in as comfort women, something that we've seen in other, um, other types of war crimes. And uh, what had happened, I guess it was the embassy of Korea or someone, the embassy of Japan in Korea, they put a statue, this golden statue, out in front of the, um, in front of the embassy. And apparently, like, the nation of Japan has not acknowledged, you know, this war crime for all of the years that it's happened, right? So uh, what some folks did was they kind of took it to the next level, and they digitized this, this, this um, statue, and they allowed people to take their own photo on social media and mask their face onto it, right, and then reshare it, and doing something that we call an invisible protest. By using geotagging, they could tag the embassy, and then, so all these people are sharing photos and tagging the embassy at the same time, like, and that's how you hack the algorithms, right? So now all of a sudden this stuff starts trending at a really high level and you can't really ignore it anymore, right? So I, I advise you guys to check it out, upload your own photo if you like. Project Metal, uh, this is a fun one. I think I'll play this one too. Uh, I can't tell you who did this one um, because we could all get in trouble. <laughs> Whoa, what happened to your voice? Uh, who would suggest somehow that you could even rage. There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even rage American elections. In 2016, Russia was losing relevance among democracy obsessed Americans. So when the United States was gearing up for the next presidential election, it was time to do something disruptive. But how could we break through in America's crowded media landscape? Our answer, Project Metal. We started by aligning ourselves with the top scary Korean firm as the face of our campaign. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia? <laughs> Putin was very nice to me. He said Donald Trump is a genius. But I'll take that, right? <laughs> then built a social newsroom to amplify his content around the clock. Our team took a first of its kind approach to early media. Instead of relying on slow moving traditional news organizations, we simply created our own news cover. Here it is, close up. The devastating photo right there that proves Hillary Clinton's crippling health condition. Using Facebook's integrated data tools, we were able to create news that was highly relevant to our target in real time. As our community grew, we amplified our reach with tier two influencers. Then deepen audience relationships with experiential stunts and innovative email strategies. And another release of hacked emails. And even integration into emerging gaming platforms. What we've learned is that the Russians even tried to use Pokemon Go to effectively galvanize African-American outrage over police brutality. When election day came, the results were undeniable. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. The campaign was number one trending topic on every news and social platform for months. In the end, we didn't just attack an election. We attacked an entire nation, faith, and democracy. America is crying tonight. I'm not sure how much of America, but a very, very significant portion. And I mean literally crying. Making Russia top of mind once again. Russia! 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 Russia. 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 And drew attention away from our support of North Korea during the nuclear experiment. So it's a little bit heady uh, in terms of like understanding how we do case studies in advertising and marketing to sort of you know, bolster our case. But just again, to sort of underscore that these are all about ideas and they're all built on insights and these executions were not expensive, right? So I'm gonna go through a couple of things here that you guys can try at home. Uh, as I mentioned, there's more in the appendix, and you know we could talk more about some of this stuff uh, as we go through it. But real quick, uh, pop quiz. Write a headline for your favorite lollipop that incorporates purpose. Or think about one. I'll give you a second. Anyone want to share? Like it. <laughs> Anyone else? You just, you just set the bar right there, my friend. <laughs> so this is something that I share with my, with my students about the creative process, eh? And how many of you feel that you kind of just went through this, like, wow, lollipops, this is awesome. Like, oh, it's, actually, it's kind of tricky. This is terrible. I'm terrible. 
This might be okay. This is awesome. <laughs> feel right? Sound am I right? Yeah. yeah. So did you feel there's a little bit of conflict in there? A little bit of truth? Okay, we're going to get to this when we talk about storytelling in a minute. But uh, I want to make sure I go over this stuff with you guys, okay? Which is, this is how you present and sell a creative idea. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, creative ideas are built on insights, powerful insights. They could be observational human insights, okay? Like there are more homeless people in the United States than there are showers. No, there's more showers in the United States than there are homeless people, right? It could be data. It could be, you know, anything that is powerful and unique and transformative. So you could think of it like it's true that statement, right? Then you look at the strategy. And usually we frame this as a what if question, okay? So building on that example that there are more empty showers than there are homeless people, what if we could get access to these showers for these people on a more regular basis? We could possibly impact homelessness, right? So this is a creative strategy. Then that builds up to a platform or an idea, you could call it. And that platform is usually like a we believe statement. For the writers in the room, it's typically a manifesto, right? It doesn't always have to be, but it's usually sort of the communication platform. So before I cross the dotted line here, I just want to point out that over here is when you think about purpose, okay? Your insight is probably based on some sort of purpose. You want to help the world. You want to do some good. Your strategy, again, is thinking about how can we make an impact on this population. And then when you get to the platform, you start to speak your purpose, okay? Speak your truth, if you want to quote Britney Spears. And that's when you start with the we believe statement, okay? Now, a lot of that is internal to the process. It's something you could do in your head. It's something you could do with your teams. The way that we as creatives tend to present these ideas is in three simple slides, right? We'll give you the insight, give you the strategy, and we'll give you the platform of the idea, okay? That's how we'd present an idea to our teams and say, this is what we're thinking. When you cross over the dotted line, you get into the external process. And this is where oftentimes most people start and fail. <laughs> because campaigns, Campaigns are what people will see. A campaign is usually a one-way message, right? It's an ad, it's a TV commercial, it's a billboard, it's a poster. People oftentimes jump right to the tactics, right? What are people gonna do? I'm gonna build an app, I'm gonna have an event, I'm gonna throw a party, right? It, it, not that it can't be done that way, and there's plenty of examples of how it is, but that typically you'll find yourself kind of working backwards and digging yourself out of a hole, which is a little bit tricky. So again, when you're thinking about your creative ideas, Find the insight, that human truth that everyone can connect to, okay? That is what's going to ground your creative idea. Your platform could be thrown out in two seconds, okay? But your insight is what you'll always come back to. It's your rock. Your strategy, your what-if statement, is setting you in the frame of mind of how are you going to approach solving this problem. And then your platform, again, is going to be where you get your messaging from. For the communications folks in the house, you're probably very familiar with this, this type of thinking. When you get to the campaign, now you're getting into execution, okay? So again, just to back up, everything to the left of that dotted line doesn't cost any money, all right? On the right-hand side, that's where it gets a little tricky and you gotta get creative and maybe find some budgets. You know, we paid for these flags ourselves out of our own pocket, right? So just, sometimes that's just what you have to do. Everyone feel good about this? Right. I'm just curious, because a flag like this, is it as simple as that? That was your internal process, is that straightforward? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean about the flag? Like, when, when we're pitching this idea, right? Mm -hmm. We can like support whether it was the music mm -hmm. or other ambassadors, and that's what you use. That's pretty much how you can sort of. Yeah, let me let me try to, to deconstruct that. When we're pitching it outside to people after we've already done all of this work. Yeah. Well, we, we should, people were already connecting with the refugee issue. We had the Muslim ban going on at the same time. It kind of spoke for itself. And because we had the work from the Olympics as well, it's, it, people identified with it from the refugee Olympic team. So it was, it was really baked in, right, to a lot of it, which is sort of like, you know, representative of the power of a symbol, right? Um, was that helpful? But internally, when you're thinking about an idea and you're working with your teams and you're like, hey, I got an idea, I want to share it with you all, think about the insight Think about the strategy and the platform. That's the storytelling. So back to the flag example, did your internal process sound something like this? This team is perceivably displaced or yet displaced, not even perceivably, right? What if we created a way to unite them and yep. the platform was, I don't know. A borderless nation that represents 65 million people around the world is united by a simple symbol that 
breeds hope and opportunity. When you wrap this thing around yourself, it looks like a life jacket, yeah. right? So that's just one way of approaching it. But right, you, you, you've got the idea, okay? You know, part of, oops, skipping ahead. Part of that was, uh, our insight was, hey, for the first time ever, there's a team of refugee athletes competing in the Olympics, the biggest stage ever. And they're competing under the Olympic flag, which stands for sponsorships and whatever, you know? Doesn't stand for, for refugees. Doesn't stand for what these people went through. So that was, so what if, to your point, we could do something and help them have that national identity that every other team at the Olympics has. Sure. Sure. I mean, I wouldn't say we're formally like rigid with any way. I mean, we'll take whatever approach works. Sometimes it just comes, just works, right? But agile is more about getting the work done, not so much coming up with the idea, right? Because we're working with no budgets, no direction, we're working on our spare time, we have to compartmentalize the work and make people a little bit more independent in what they're doing, okay? So I'm going to go through this. Uh, you're all familiar with this, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So create, so at the University of Connecticut, I was a clinical psychology major, and that's what I was doing at Brown University, torturing people in a lab, <laughs> feeding them drugs, and testing their reaction to cigarettes. So this stuff is really near and dear to my heart. So when I was thinking about the creative work and the creative process and what creativity means, this is where I naturally came back to. Okay? And as, as you can all see, creativity is at the top of the peak. Now, is anyone, are you guys familiar with what this is? Other than a pyramid. <laughs> this is what we call a messaging hierarchy. right? So it's, it's, it's basically the same kind of idea. So when you think about this from a brand standpoint, okay, you have the proof points. Um, you know, your bottle of water is made from recycled plastic. Okay? Then you have the functional benefit. right? That, you know, so that is whatever the benefit, functional benefit of using recycled plastic may be. Right? Then you get into differentiation. Then you get into the compelling story. Then you get into the emotional hot buttons. And I think those three steps are usually the hardest for people. You know, when you're doing a creative brief, oftentimes you're given the proof points and you're given the benefits at least that the client wants you to, you know, wants you to espouse. But those are at the bottom of the pyramid, they're not at the top. So that's where creativity comes in, is the differentiation, finding the compelling story, and talking about the emotional hot buttons. And only then do you arrive at what we would call a big idea. So you guys can use this in your work when you guys go back to um, all the places that you're working at to evaluate creative ideas, to dissect them, to analyze them, and to build your own, okay? It's very simple, it's all stuff you're all familiar with, it's just looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, I took it out for, for the purpose of this class, but I can share it with you. Um, that the, this thing here, right, these five um, circles, they map to this triangle, okay? So the insight is mapped usually to the functional benefits and the proof points, okay? Strategy is mapped to emotional hot buttons and compelling stories. Your platform is mapped to the big idea. Your campaign comes down the other side and is mapped to emotional hot buttons and compelling stories, right? That's what campaigns do, they get your attention. Then the tactics are marked will be functional benefits and proof points because that's when people engage with it, right? So if that's, say, uh, an app that you're developing, that'll, that'll fall down here. And then the sixth one I put down here is partners, okay? Uh, something that our, our CCO Jimmy Stone is very fond of saying is that your ideas have to pee from the top of the mountain. <laughs> so anyone not familiar with that metaphor or the law of hydrodynamics? So anyway, that, so your big idea will align with the, the ideas of your partners, right? So for, I know the speaker before talked about partnerships and working with other uh, nonprofits. Uh, this is something, oh, you can't quite see it here on the top. This is something uh, that the pr president of the Berlin School taught, teaches us on our first day of class, which is like ironically about three years to the date from where we are uh, today. So, but it's called Seven Steps to Heaven. And he developed it uh, as when he was the worldwide CCO of uh, Leo Burnett to help his clients understand what is good creative work. And I share this with you today so that you can understand this is a way to analyze creative work, right? To re review creative work and understand it and to, to differentiate one from the other. So you can go through this in the appendix and I put some cool examples in there for you. Uh, but the, uh, basically how it works is you want to be at seven or higher, right? Seven and below is bad, seven and higher is good, right? So nobody wants the work to be appalling, destructive, non-competitive, or cliche. You guys agree with that? 
Okay, cool. Uh, innovative strategy. Okay, that's cool. Fresh idea. All right, that's fine. But that's not going to really, that's not going to turn heads, right? Uh, that's definitely not going to bring in budgets and that's not going to win you grants. Excellence in craft, now you're getting somewhere, okay? But that's not enough, is it? Being a new standard in the category, a new standard of communication, or even the most inspiring in the world, that's where you want your ideas and your work to be, okay? So when you need, next time you see a commercial, think about this. You know, ask someone else what they think. Um, if we have more time, I'd, I'd run you through and, and get your opinions on, on some of that stuff. So I'm going to try to go through this real quick here uh, to talk about where do stories come from. People oftentimes like, oh, tell me a story. What's the brand story? You know, kind of makes my ears grate a little bit sometimes <laughs> because, you know, you don't invent these things, right? Stories are archetypes, okay? You guys familiar with archetypes? Okay. So an archetype is a term described, you know, used to describe universal symbols that evoke deep and sometimes unconscious responses. Characters, symbols, etc. Literary archetypes of quests, um, scapegoats, etc. descents into the underworld, all sorts of fun things. Um, interestingly enough, what does that image look like to you? A what? Looks like a pelvic area, okay. <laughs> of a man or a woman? I usually get that answer from women. Anyone else? Sorry? Bunny rabbit, yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it's, I've been like doing my little mini Rorschach test with people every time I give this one. What about this image? Yeah, tree, pulmonary system, yeah. Yeah, these are, these are photographs from a friend of mine, uh, you know, Chris Garrison, who, if you turn it this way, yeah, it's a tree and it's just mirrored, but I always think it looks like a brain. So situational archetypes, you're probably familiar with these, the task, the quest, the loss of innocence, or initiation, right? Lord of the Rings is a great example of, ta of the task. Shrek is a great example of the quest. Loss of innocence, et cetera, you can go on and on and on. So when you're looking at films and movies, et cetera, think about these archetypes. What are they representing? Because I guarantee you they represent one of, the, one of the others. There's a great book, I think it's called The Seven Stories or Seven Archetypes or whatever. You can read it's a little bit thick. So. Some of the common archetypes that we're familiar with, the hero, the outcast, the scapegoat, the star-crossed lover, the shrew. Everyone here know what the shrew is? You know, it's funny, I, I did this, this talk in China, and surprisingly, they didn't know anything else except the shrew. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how things translate, right? <laughs> so, you know, this, this is something that I like to share uh, with, with you all to think about. All stories have three basic parts, okay? Every story in the world is based on these three things. Conflict, challenge, and resolution, okay? Your story, my story, the story you're going to see on TV later, whatever you're reading on the internet. They all fall into these categories. So when you're telling a story or being asked to tell a story, go back to these three things. It's the three-act play, okay? Anybody see the movie Taken? What's the conflict? What's the challenge? What's the resolution? Pretty simple, right? <laughs> but most of these, you know, going back to the conflict, if you think about Liam Neeson's character, what was he doing? He was chilling, living his life in retirement, right? Wasn't he some like, you know, special forces guy that ran around the world like doing bad things and he sort of was like recoup. So what was the conflict that he had to deal with? He had to go back to that world, right? He didn't want to do that, but he had to do it. And then his challenge obviously rolled out in resolution. So the conflict stage is the really interesting part. And what did I tell you guys before about presenting creative ideas? Where do you start? Insight. Insight and conflict, right? Usually pretty closely related. So um, everyone here familiar with Star Wars? You have heard of it? Good, because I had this problem. I taught a whole class <laughs> using this, and then a, this guy from Nigeria is like, I never saw Star Wars, man. And I was like, dude, you should have told me that before. So uh, without conflict, there's no story. And for, the, for those that are familiar with the idea of Star Wars, it's probably one of the longest running creative platforms ever created, right? And there's just tons of conflict in there all day long. But without truth, there's no platform, okay? So here, you see love, you know, you see friendship, mentorship, right? Conflict plus truth equal platform, okay? This is the only math you will see today. <laughs> but you cannot do this otherwise, okay? If you don't have conflict and you don't have truth, you will not have a viable creative platform. Make sense? Platforms are how we tell stories. 
I'm your father. That's a pretty powerful story when you're hanging off the edge of the Death Star and you're about to plummet to your death. Also quite captivating. But there's something in that idea, right, of what Luke was looking for and what he was searching for, and he finally found it at a moment of betrayal. Well, I'm going to switch to my friend Stephen King. Everyone familiar with this gentleman? Um, who knows the story of Carrie? Yeah? What happened? <laughs> but it's a story about being a teenage girl in high school, right? And for anyone who's been a teenage girl in high school, there's a lot going on there. Okay? A lot going on. So Stephen King in his book on writing, which I suggest you all read if you can, it's a lovely memoir, he talks about, you know, stories are like fossils, right? They've existed before us. And the way that we find these stories is by carefully digging away at the earth around these fossils and they will reveal themselves. And he uses the metaphor of an archaeologist trying to discover a dinosaur. It's like you think you have a leg bone and it's going to go this way, and then as you clear it away, it goes that way. And you can just follow that. As you're finding your story, you're telling your story, right? What's the story of The Shining? Guy goes crazy in a, like, some ski mansion like all by himself and starts hallucinating. Anyone who's lived in New York can relate. <laughs> Cujo, what if you, your car broke down on the side of the highway and you were being you know, circled by a rabid dog? Whoa, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so you uncover these fossils by reading and writing, trying and failing and trying again. And now our last section here, just a few words from our sponsors to wrap it up and then we can have some questions. Uh, jean michel Basquiat, one of the inspiring fine artists of his time, said, I like kids' work more than work made by real artists any day. And what I think he meant by that is that creativity is supposed to be playful. Don't be afraid to have fun with it, okay? It's not all serious. Stephen King, remember, we're also talking about magic. Creativity is trans transmutation, it's alchemy, it's black magic. You're, making, you're bringing artifacts into the world that haven't existed before, but really you're just combining two novel ideas, two ideas in a novel way, and presenting it in a way people haven't seen before. People are attracted to magic. Ask David Blaine. Stories allow people to let themselves go on the journey, and that creativity is the magic come to life. Our buddy at Ernest Hemingway is famous for saying, write drunk and edit sober. I amend this to say, write drunk with love and edit sober with contempt. When you're doing your creative work, let your heart pour out on the page, okay? Only later do you go back and really chop it up. Uh, too many times, we've all seen it, someone has an idea, it's not fully formed, what was it, suck and, suck and save or something like that, and then they're like, that's horrible, it's offensive, you know, you know we're going to get fired. Okay, fine. You mentioned design thinking. That's part of the design thinking process, right? Put all the ideas out and then go back and winnow them down later, okay? Nora Ephron, great uh, documentary on HBO, Everything is Copy. Take notes, everything is copy. You know, create from what you know, create from what you don't know. Just uh, learn it from someone that does. Just be authentic, do it with truth, and do it with integrity. Our shirtless friend here, Pablo Picasso, is famous for saying, good art is copy, great art is steal. And I uh, think, again, what he was trying to say is don't be afraid to stand on the shoulders of giants. We're oftentimes not reinventing the creative re wheel with what we're doing. We're only really building on it. And frankly, a lot of the creative work is built on other creative work. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. However, the course of true love never did run smooth. Uh, Shakespeare, one of the greatest of times, you know, is, is saying that as creatives and creative work, our, our job and our responsibility is to interpret these deep emotional issues, right? And put them on the page of the screen. This is really hard stuff. It's not easy to do. And sometimes we cry when we're doing it, and that's all right, too. Uh, one of my icons, David Ogilvie, who's lucky enough to work at his agency, is famous for saying that creativity is just a highfalutin word for the work that I have to do between now and Tuesday. So, yeah, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. But at the same time, when we're doing this work, especially in the context of this class, we need to add value to the world with what we do, okay? It's not creativity for creativity's sake. That is called art. I don't know who this guy is. I just had to pull a picture up and throw it in there. Um, but he says that thinking, you know, that's creative too. And what others call procrastinations, writers like myself and creatives that I work with, we call that thinking. Give your mind time to work. You know, get all the information together that you can. Study it as deeply, as intently as you can. Work on your ideas, but like, let the subconscious work on it too. And you'll see that in this book as well. And that is what I have for you guys today. Thank you.
All right, let them rip. Yeah, that's where we got the five billion from. So um, I didn't do it myself, obviously, uh, but uh, yeah, we have people that you know social analytics that we could find. There's, I think, a lot of publicly available tools, right, that you can use dashboards to sort of measure measure these things. That's not necessarily my wheelhouse, but sure. Anybody else? Yeah. Are you a pirate? Haha. Yes. Usually I end this on pirates wanted. Um, <laughs> sure. Send send me an email. Okay. My email address is up there. Um, I also started with my portfolio. It's gilcruinary.com. Um, if you guys want to find it, you can, you can find it out there. And you can see sort of all this work, all the other work I've done, some of my music work, download some mixes and some tracks, have a party tonight. Uh, I'll just rip through this appendix real quick so you guys can see. It's just some cool stuff about copywriting. You could share this with people uh, back, back home. This is the seven steps to heaven where you could go through some of these different, you know, um, ads and, and just to see them. I put this section together, how we can work better. It's about creative briefs and alignment. It's just very straightforward stuff that you, you know, you could use. Do you have a sample of a mini brief that you use? I don't know, but I could provide one for you. Go ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about the timeline for the flag? Um, you know, just some of the steps, the timeline, how long it took, what mm -hmm. some, some of the steps along the way? Sure. Let me, let me try to do my best to answer that. So the Olympics started probably like in July, June or July. So right around the time that they announced it, we started working on the project. But again, it was very self-directed. So it wasn't like we're like, oh, we have this and we have a timeline and we have a production schedule. So uh, there were several weeks of iterating different ideas, different names, different flag designs, and um, then getting shot down and being this isn't going to work, right? So it took uh, you know, a few weeks, maybe a month or so, before we got to the point of reaching out to Yara. And then uh, it was frankly like in a discussion over the phone where it, she just blurted out, hey, it should look, what if it made it look like a, um, a life preserver? And that's sort of that like aha eureka moment, right? Where we just sketched it in two seconds and it was done. But it took a, while, it took a bit of time to get there, right? So then from, from having the idea, and then we had to sort of get flags produced, get them down to Brazil, and then get them into people's hands. So that, that all happened quite over the summer, right? And then at the end of the summer, at the end of the games around September, we continued to push it and iterate it. You saw some stuff that was um, from the protest in front of Trump Tower during the Muslim ban, um, in the Muslim travel ban in early 2017, I guess it was. And we just kept pushing it. So we're still working on it, right? Did this have to go through the US Olympic Committee since it was you know, being shown in their event? I mean, yeah, of course we had to, you know, we had to liaise with all of the, the appropriate bodies. And that again was just iterative communication. But going back to the pod system, that, that's why we break things down into pods so that people can sort of work simultaneously on, on, on this different parts of the project at the same time. And is it finally, is that color in the Pantone color, the official color, is that <laughs> orange? No, seriously, no, I know, is that I, orange that you can bite in life vests? Yeah, I believe it is. Is that an actual Pantone color that's a trademark copyright color? Not to us, no. No, no, I understand yeah. not to you, but to others. I don't believe that this is, a, I mean, this is the official like uh, rescue color. I believe that we did the research to make sure we use the right color. We don't own it, nobody else owns it. This flag is Creative Commons, by the way. If any of you want to use this, you can download the files from our website. You can make your own flag. It is completely open and open source to everybody. Oh, I think you had your hand up first. Sure, thanks. Um, you referenced the Pepsi ad, and we all look at that and we say, okay, yeah. Yeah. It was intentional. Have you ever been a part of something that we all thought, or you all thought it was great, and then it just went horribly wrong? What were the lessons learned? I don't know if I'd admit it on camera, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, you know, thankfully wasn't part of the Pepsi ad, and I, I mean, I could give you my opinion on what happened, but I, I don't know what happened. You know, um, I think when we see ads like that, it's often sort of, you know, things happen really fast, and people are under a lot of pressure and the process breaks down at some point, and then people are just forced to execute things. I, I would imagine there was <clears throat> plenty of people that had voiced their concerns, but that was, I think, if, if I remember correctly, produced by Pepsi's internal creative team and not by an agency. So that's probably like a case study and the dangers of having an internal creative team, right? Because you know you kind of lose your independence there. So that's just my personal opinion. Don't take it as fact, but uh, did, was that helpful? Uh, and yeah, we, I've been, I don't know if I've been on any project that like had such backlash, you know, like where people are offended. I mean, we really try not to do that. Um, but uh, I guess 
If I think of an example, I'll let you know later. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, if you guys have more questions, I'll be having lunch with you. I'll be here for a couple of hours, so feel free to come up. We can chat as long as you want, okay? I think that Gil did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you for your time, guys. So down in steps that people can digest and I know even for some your heads may still be spinning because there's left brain right brain but I think that you did a fantastic job thank you thank you for telling having that me. story and I, I was so moved um, by the refugee campaign I, I saw that in the Olympics yeah. it was incredible it's great. yeah so thank you for that right. and we we're just keep on we're moving if you want to hear more about how Gil didn't create any appalling <laughs> <things>. <laughs> I'm glad you missed step one yeah <laughs> available at the topic table luncheon yeah. so we'll, looking forward you'll, you'll to have, it again if you haven't signed up for him then you certainly can switch as we go along now i want to welcome our thank you so much of course some people who are very quickly moving to the back and that's I mean, the hell's kitchen a lot <laughs> you go you go sorry sorry have them on the marathon but i'd like to welcome the chief marketing officer Oh, forgot about this okay, one. Okay, sweetie. Yeah, we didn't have to. I apologize. Okay, Avert your eyes. On yeah. that one. Okay, good. Yeah.